I'm John Puthichery, a politician and the occasional host of documentaries. Go, go, where, right yes, correct, correct, correct. Ah. I'll admit it, I went pretty far to get your attention. But that's because this is not a new message. We will literally be in deep water. We must prepare for the impact of climate change on Singapore. We have no time to lose. The global thermostat continues to rise. We need a unified national response to climate change. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. How dare you continue to look away? Like me, you'll have heard these messages of doom and gloom so often that you're tempted to tune it all out. But ignoring all that would have real and measurable consequences. If greenhouse emissions stay as they are, by 2050 in Singapore, we can expect a rise in temperature of about 1.3 degrees Celsius. This will affect sea levels, which may rise by about 30 centimetres, taking us to there. We'll also see more extreme weather. I'm talking about droughts and intense flooding. What do we want? When do you want it? So the pressure is on. It's time to talk about it. In the blazingly short period since we've gained independence, we've got an international praise for how we've turned around housing, game-changed waste management. We incinerate all our waste. We even generate electricity in the process and built an enviable economy from almost nothing. But how will we deal with our most challenging problem yet? Daniel, can you identify the items with plastic in this fridge? In this four-part series, I go on the ground to expose our blind spots. Can you guess how long it takes Singapore to use this number of plastic bags? And open up difficult conversations. That is uh, what we call a small module reactor, or SMR for short. What more can we do? Or what more must we do about climate change? By now, it feels like everyone has heard of climate change. Even six-year-olds. Earth is getting warmer. It is the human fault. When we burn fuel for cars, we are also building more factories that also can cause carbon dioxide to happen. It will get warmer and warmer and Earth will get sick. I will get sick. We will die. The mechanics of climate change are not difficult to explain. I can do it with everyday things. Some gases, like carbon dioxide, are very good at trapping heat on the Earth's surface, just like a glass roof. This is called the greenhouse effect. In itself, not a bad thing, because without it, Earth would be much colder. Then we entered the Industrial Revolution. The advent of fossil fuels changed our lives. The burning of oil, coal and natural gas is used to support everything from manufacturing, electricity generation, to transportation. Releasing huge amounts of greenhouse gases in the process. Since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide in our air has shot up by 40%. Why is this bad news for us? Hot air in our atmosphere holds more moisture causing heavier rainfall and stronger thunderstorms. We'll see more extreme weather phenomena like flash floods. The increase in heat is also melting our polar caps and our glaciers. This causes a rise in sea levels. Terrible news for an island city like Singapore and we're leaving it to our children and grandchildren to deal with that reality. When I grow up, Singapore may be like an ocean. Our homes will be destroyed. Then we will have nowhere to live. We will go to another house that is very high. You swim. That's why we must go to like 
other countries. Maybe you can go to Japan. <laughs> so what is Singapore doing about it? In 2019, we became the first Southeast Asian country to introduce a carbon tax. And while solar energy currently only has enough juice to power 60,000 households, we aim to bump that up to 350,000 households in the next 10 years. We launched an initiative to plant 1 million trees by 2030. Trees can absorb carbon from the air. And we will phase out internal combustion vehicles by 2040. We have also committed to halve our emissions from peak level by 2050. But some of our youth believe we can push far, far harder. In March 2020, a group of young political activists put out a proposal paper called Singapore a Green Hub. It's a proposal which is really quite ambitious and extraordinary. They want us to become carbon neutral as a country. In just 20 years, they are setting a deadline and laying out the steps for us to get there by 2040. It's very ambitious. To reach that goal, they are pushing to increase our carbon tax by 20 times, impose tariffs on imported goods that are produced from unsustainable sources, and even move away from measuring Singapore's growth with GDP alone. I must say, I'm not convinced. I think it's going to be difficult, not impossible, to pull this off. It will have a huge impact on jobs, opportunities, growth. Their jobs, their future, how will they pull it off? They will write this off as boomer scepticism. But I just want to point out, I'm actually Generation X. Why are these young activists so convinced that such drastic steps are needed? Most countries have a goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. But these youth want to set a target for Singapore to be carbon neutral by 2040. Pragmatic or a pipe dream? I'm going to have to do some work to find out. It might be a Sunday, but all these volunteers are out here in Katib Bongsu to clean up the mangrove area. It takes a whole hour to kayak to this spot, where decades of trash have accumulated. Kenneth is 29 years old, a millennial, and he is one of eight young activists who worked on the proposal. Kenneth, you're suggesting that Singapore needs to be carbon neutral by 2040? Yes, that's right. How do you want us to get there 10 years ahead of everybody else? If Anyone could achieve this goal, I believe it's Singapore. The government has already done much to protect the environment, but at the same time, I believe more can be done to coordinate efforts uh, between ministries and between industries. And uh, this dialogue has to be continued uh, to achieve uh, these goals. But you know, there's a cost associated with these types of sustainability goals, right? A reduction in economic opportunity, maybe even less jobs for your generation. We have to weigh the priority. What's the point of having an economy if we don't have a world to live in? How much is your generation willing to give up to solve this problem? I think our generation is willing to give up as much as we need to to address the climate emergency. I'll be honest, it was very tempting to write it all off as youthful naivete. But could I dig deeper and see if the youth are pushing in the right direction? I'm at the nation's first zero-waste grocery store, opened in 2018. Everything we produce takes energy. So consuming just what you need, producing less packaging, lowers our carbon footprint. There's been a growing movement to live sustainably, particularly among young Singaporeans. Organic rice face masks, and beeswax wraps, and... and an unpaper kitchen towel, what my mother would have just called a regular towel.
I'm not here just to shop. I'm here to meet Matthew, a lecturer at Yale NUS. Hi, how are you? Thanks for being here. He compiled and published a book of essays, all written by his young students. So, from the essays, mm. can you sort of sum up how you and the young people that you interact with mm. feel about climate change? I think they feel incredibly anxious. Some of them feel hopeless, given the scale of the problem and what they see as uh, the slowness in responding to it. And do they really think we're not doing enough to secure their future? I mean, our commitments will have serious impact on their jobs and their future, and they think it's still not enough? Why? I think in reality, it's people that are our age and older sometimes that have a problem understanding the real gravity of the situation. We came of age at a time economic growth is necessary. Singapore was burdened with a load of economic problems. Jobs were scarce. Industrialization was the only solution. It was on this windswept, empty tract of land that the first factory was built. Environment was kind of optional, right? It was kind of like sprinkles on ice cream. You could take it or you could leave it. I'm not sure sprinkles are optional, much, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, but ultimately what we realized is that uh, the environment is sort of like the cone, right? Uh, if you don't have a cone, then the ice cream just falls through your hand and you can't even eat it. So I want to play my part. I want to do what I can. And you look like you walk the talk. You know, you've got this uh, reusable tote bag. We're meeting in a zero-waste store. Uh, I presume you make decisions about your lifestyle, your clothing, your consumption, with reference to climate change. What if I did all of those things, starting today? Would that make a difference? Nothing. Nothing? Sadly. It doesn't matter what I, what I purchase or what I, I think consume? It, or... it, I think those are all things that'll make you feel good about yourself, but they're going to be a drop in the ocean. You know, I think... There's a saying that the most you can do as an individual is to not be an individual. And so that means that you can be part of a collective. And that can be a collective that, you know, contacts your MP and lets them know, you know, that you're concerned about climate change. My constituents do write to me, but mm. it's not usually about climate change. How do we reframe this issue for the much larger group of Singaporeans <laughs> who perhaps are not so concerned about it? I think ultimately uh, it has to come through government. Um, it has to come through a massive education campaign. I think we need to uh, really um, change our entire uh, way of thinking about the world such that we end up putting the environment a lot closer to the center. Now it's more urgent than ever to turn our attention to the environment. Just in 2020 alone, we've already racked up a heavy cost for climate change worldwide. Australia saw the worst wildfires in decades, racking up five billion US dollars in damage. And more than 445 deaths were linked to it. We also saw some of the worst storms on record. Cyclone Ampan cost the Indian government 13 billion US dollars. Kyushu floods resulted in losses of about 8.5 billion US dollars. In both events, many lost their lives. These people from around the world are already facing the devastating effects of climate change. I reached out to them to find out just how their lives have been affected. In 2020, that wildfire was the biggest one that we've seen so far. And... The 20th storm that hit our place recently was the Typhoon Ulysses. In 2020, we had the coldest November in 71 years. The sky turned orange. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like this before. It was like we were in a movie. I am an asthmatic patient. I have, uh, you know, had to be admitted once in the hospital. Typhoon Ulysses was so destructive in such a way that it caused blood, massive blood all over the places. And even if you just went outside for 10 minutes, you'd start to cough because the air quality was so bad. I am actually alarmed and uh, worried about our future, especially the people like us living in uh, low areas. This is all happening right now to people like Ephraim in the Philippines, Eduardo in California, Adia in India, and millions more. I want to find out how I can help Singaporeans feel the urgency. So I've worked with CNA to commission a nationwide survey. This will be the first survey of its kind in Singapore conducted after a devastating global event. One that likely caused 
seismic changes to our fight against climate change. Well, the results of the survey are in. And one of the numbers that really jumped out at me is that four out of 10 think that Singapore is too small to make any impact on climate change. Which is why I need to resort to this to startle us out of our complacency. I always thought that Singapore is spared the brunt of devastating weather caused by climate change. Until now. Within minutes of the dark clouds forming, I've been told to head to specific coordinates in the west of Singapore. We just received this heavy rain warning. Okay. Wherever you go, that's where the rain is heaviest. Yes. <laughs> so if I see you, I go the other way. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Can I have a look? And then you've got like what? First aid kits? And... Yeah, we have a first aid kit and we have a safety phone and traffic basin. I see. To direct traffic itself. So let's say the rain gets heavier and heavier. It's actually a bit out of control. We actually activate our flood barrier. So this is to divert the water somewhere else? Yes, this is actually for a diversion as well. Matthew and Azil are members of PUB's quick response team. Other team members like them are stationed all around Singapore. Their job is to stand by in dedicated vans, all so that they can be the first responders to areas of heavy rainfall in Singapore. So this looks okay. Apparently this looks okay. Because there's no blockage. They then have to check every drain in the area and clear them of blockages to prepare for the next big downpour. Do you find that the weather is uh, getting worse in some way? Whether the, the heavy rain warnings, are there are more of them now? Yes, the number of activation is actually increased. We realise that actually there's more intense rain, partly due to these uh, climate changes. So intense rain actually normally lasts around now one hour itself. Then if let's say the intense rain, the heavy burst of raining, actually overflow our this uh, drainage system. Let's cause this uh, flash flood. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciated the explanation. Take care. Thank you. Catch, see you later. So despite the rising intensity of rainfall, I found out that we have this great big team of people making sure that we're safe from flash floods, keeping our drains clear, keeping us safe. Maybe that's why we don't personally feel the brunt of climate change here in Singapore. Annual rainfall has been creeping upwards at a rate of 9 millimetres per decade since 1980. That won't change the amount of downpour drastically, but what we'd actually notice is more extreme weather patterns. More frequent periods of intense rain, as well as periods of drought. I've met the frontliners, now to head to the control centre, the team in charge of deploying people like Matthew and Azil. This is our 24 7 op centre where we do flood monitoring. Mm -hmm. We actually monitor the real time condition of the roads uh, through our CCTVs uh, over here and uh, also through our water level sensors uh, installed on our drains and canal. So that will actually help us to uh, deploy our QRT crews uh, ahead of time. How long have you had a quick response team here at PUB? Well, we formed our quick response team uh, almost the same time as our uh, op centre in 2012. Have you all seen an increase in the uh, rainfall intensity after 2012? Yeah, definitely. We do see an uh, intense rainstorm uh, event happening. In 2020 alone, we do see three rain events, 30th April, 23rd June as well as 14 August. Do we have to keep doing more and more and more to prevent flooding if, if the rainfall intensity is rising? PUB actually invested uh, almost 2 billion since 2011 uh, to come up with 
drainage improvement uh, projects such as our Stanford Detection Tank and our canal, as well as our Bukit Timah First Diversion Canal. So, all in all, we have completed these projects to help to improve the drainage structure, but with the scarcity of land in Singapore, we can't expect to continue widening or deepening our drainage infrastructure. I'll bet many of us have walked along this road without noticing. This is one of many roads in Singapore that have been raised quite significantly to prevent future flooding from affecting traffic. That's about as much as we can do for our current infrastructure. On top of that, we're also going to have to improve our coastal defenses. That's going to cost us about 100 billion Singapore dollars over the next 50 to 100 years. I wonder if Singaporeans can grasp the gravity of the threat that rising sea levels pose to Singapore. I'm going to bring to our doorstep one effect of climate change that's happening far, far away, over 7,000 kilometers away from Singapore. But it's happening right now, and it's threatening the very existence of our island. These blocks represent ice in the Arctic. We know a rise in global temperature has caused our Arctic ice to melt at an alarming rate. And melting Arctic ice will cause rising sea levels that will encroach on low-lying islands like Singapore. And now, a study has linked just how much Arctic ice melts for every ton of carbon emissions from humans. Hi, we're making a documentary about climate change. We have global warming, ice will melt, right? Yes, that's right. So my question is, how long does it take one Singaporean to generate the carbon emissions that will melt this amount of ice? One person's carbon emission might not be that much to melt this big block of ice. Not so big, maybe it takes more time to melt. Maybe 20 years. 20 years. You, you think it's a, a problem far into the future? Uh, yes. Global warming? What if I tell you that is too far, too long? It's much shorter, much faster. 10 years? 5 ten, years? 10 years or 5 years? Yep. Still <laughs> faster. Faster. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, Want to give a number? Maybe two years. Two years? Yes. Right. Uh, it's a lower than that. Five months? Five months. How about yourself? Seven months. Seven months? No, still lower. Okay, then it will be, uh, say, four months. Four. Even faster than that, still faster. Are you getting worried? Yes. Because if, if that's the case, that means uh, our climate is changing drastically. More. One or two weeks. You are in the correct ballpark. It's about five days. Oh, five days. Five days. Five days. Five days. Five days. Five days. Yeah. I didn't expect one person to be able to contribute so much to the impact. But if I tell you this amount of ice melts as a result of five days of emissions, you think we can wait until her generation? Of course not. I think that's the key message we're trying to get across. It's actually our problem. Yeah. And we have to start doing things now, not wait for their generation to, to start stepping up. I get what I mean. Remember, this is the amount of ice that melts as a result of five days of emissions from just one Singaporean. Imagine the effect that 50 of us would have. And what about five million? When do you think you will feel the impact of climate change personally? When do I feel? Actually, right now, we can already feel the impact. I did, I did notice that the weather is probably quite erratic nowadays. Uh. So like you can see every day, the rain is very intense. Do you think in Singapore, we can do something as a country to help climate change? Yes. What would you like to see us do? I think we, we don't really like um, use energy wisely. Yeah. I think that's why it takes like only five days to melt this block of ice. So what is it that you think you can do now, now that you understand the urgency of the problem? Yes. What might you do? 
consuming less. Maybe be more conscious with our transportation. I think I've hit home the point that these changes in the weather that we feel every day are directly linked to our carbon emissions. But what's got me really worried is the latest research that suggests we don't have a moment to lose to focus all our energies on preventing runaway climate change. To keep the Earth from warming beyond 2 degrees Celsius, we should be cutting down carbon emissions by at least 3% a year. But even up till 2019, global emissions were still climbing, hitting an all-time high, year after year. But there might be some hope on the horizon. 2020 happened. Could this really turn our fight around? I'm at the top of the ramp tower at Changi Airport. And these days, that's the closest that I will get to an aircraft. Before the pandemic, the average resident in Singapore scored the second highest in the world for carbon emissions from flying. But for 2020, my carbon emissions from flying have been zero. This place seems eerily quiet now. But a year and a half ago, you'd see a plane taking off or landing every 80 seconds. Compared to climate change, the pandemic has been a much more visible and tangible disaster for us in Singapore. A hundred billion Singapore dollars from our reserves, committed, lost jobs for many families. More importantly, lost lives, tragedy for friends and loved ones. Now that truly felt like the end of the world. Which is probably why, in the survey we commissioned, we asked, what are the most pressing issues you think the government should address this year? COVID-19 pandemic, cost of living, and the economy hogged the top three spots. Only 16% felt that climate change is a pressing issue. But there is an apparent silver lining. We can actually see that the pandemic is doing the impossible for our climate all around the world. Empty roads, clear skies, and coupled with reduced economic activities in most parts of the world, an estimated 2.6 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide was never emitted in 2020. So it makes me feel like we might have turned the game around on climate change. I'm not alone in feeling this way. The same survey revealed that six out of 10 of us believe that the pandemic had at least some positive impact on the environment. Other than not flying, we also lowered our personal carbon footprint in other ways. Five in 10 said they took taxis and private hire vehicles less than before the pandemic. Four in 10 said that they drove less. It might feel like we have our eye on the ball for once, but I'm told there is someone I must meet. Hey, Winston. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Okay. <laughs> Great to see you. How are you, man? Okay. Why are we meeting on a football field? Because apart from doing climate research as a scientist, I love football. I love watching football in Singapore. And is there a link between climate change and football? <laughs> I would argue there is. For a successful Singapore football team to happen, we need to have a good team of players on the field. 
we need to have a good coaching staff, we need to have a good admin structure, we need to have support from the fans, uh, both in the stadium and outside. Everybody has to be invested in that singular goal to have a good football team. For a good climate to happen, you need to have significant investments from individuals, families, communities. You need to have uh, buy-in from the private sector as well. So you think both can be addressed? <sighs> Uh, am I getting... Or both must be addressed. Okay, now you're putting me on the spot there. <laughs> I would like both to be addressed. But uh, honestly, I would prefer the climate issue to be addressed first. In Singapore, uh, 1994, the average temperature was about 27.2 degrees Celsius. Now, it looks like we're going to hit more than 28.4 degrees Celsius. So, you can see a big difference has changed since uh, back in the days where Singapore football was good. Okay, so hearing that from a football fan tells me how serious you are and how exactly. serious the problem is. Exactly, yes. There was a time recently where things looked like they were getting better. You know, across the world, when we were locking down, uh, different parts of the world had complete cessation of economic activity, right? Yes, the lockdown, yeah. And we saw these memes going around about nature taking over, uh, nature coming back. Yep. You remember this? It was a good contrast to the sort of images of wildfires and droughts and floods and landslides from tropical cyclones which are caused by climate change. So it's a good thing to see in that sense. But there's a but in there, however. What's the but? What's the but? It does not reflect what we need to do to make sure that uh, the wildfires, the droughts, the cyclones and everything like that will happen again because we need to do something about our carbon dioxide, our greenhouse gas emissions, which unfortunately, as much as we like to see cute animals uh, in urban areas roaming about, um, it does nothing to solve that. Didn't carbon emissions go down by quite a lot during this time? They did. Carbon emissions dropped substantially by about 9% uh, for the first half of 2020 compared to 2019. That 9% drop is equivalent to just lightly tapping on the brake. We need to start pressing harder on the brake pedal in order for that bus to stop before it crosses that 1.5 degree C threshold. So even though uh, we have uh, reduced the rate of CO2 emissions, 2020 is still on course to be the warmest year in the observational record in the history of humanity. Is there any good news in this? It's not good news. It's not good news in that sense. It's short-lived. It's frighteningly short-lived and the concern is that when life returns back to some degree of normal after COVID, that would mean that uh, the economic rebound, the emissions of greenhouse gases will come back again with a vengeance and that's the big fear. Yeah, that's a downer. Sorry for the bad news. What a sobering reality. Our pandemic habits haven't really altered our course to a warmer world very much. It's clearly going to take more than just one freak event to slow down or even reverse climate change. So it's back to the drawing board. What will it take to make a dent in climate change? The most significant greenhouse gas emitted in Singapore is carbon dioxide at 95%. Carbon dioxide is released by a huge variety of human activities. Anything that is guzzling fossil fuels for energy is also releasing carbon dioxide into the air. All that carbon dioxide will continue to trap heat and warm the planet. Yet most of the time, carbon dioxide is completely invisible to our eyes. So often, we don't realize just how much carbon we are putting into the atmosphere through our activities. So my mission today is to help Singaporeans see for themselves what carbon emissions look like. Awesome. Alrighty. I'm using balloons. 10 balloons represent about 250 grams of carbon dioxide. Represented here are the carbon emissions from five different major cities. Not for a year, a day, or even an hour. Each bunch of balloons represents 30 minutes of carbon emissions per person. What we have here, you see these five ladies and gentlemen, these volunteers, 
The balloons that they are carrying represents the amount of carbon dioxide emissions in half an hour per person. I'm getting the public to rank five cities. Singapore, New York, Stockholm, Delhi and Beijing. Which city do they think has the lowest carbon emissions per person? Stockholm would be the least, I'm guessing. So we think Stockholm's there because when they have a very heavy usage of bicycles, which is extremely, yeah. uh, you know, environmentally friendly, right? And which city has the highest carbon emissions per person? It's neither Beijing or Delhi, is it was. But what is making you think that way? They are like a third world country. They are actually progressing in their economy. So for that, the emission actually is normally higher. I live in Delhi, so I can say it's quite bad. So there's a lot of cars. Way too uh, many cars. Way too many cars. As for Singapore, most respondents chose to put us on the lower end. I think Singapore's because there's not as much uh, vehicle density and uh, it, not that many heavy uh, production. Yeah, you know, in Singapore, we've got so much conversation about you know going green, etc., etc. We are talking about all these uh, fridge, uh, washing machine, three, three tick, four tick, all these kind of things. So it's clear that most people feel that heavily polluted cities like Beijing and Delhi should be on top, and they ranked clean and green Singapore closer to the bottom. Well, they cannot be more wrong. What if I told you that the sequence was very different? Are you serious? <laughs> OK. These go all the way down here. Oh? Uh, <laughs> the other way around. Stockholm is here and New York is here, which puts us all the way up here. Singapore is first. Oh, no. oh. Why? Seriously? How come? I think what's happening is that what you're remembering is the pollutants. So you know that carbon dioxide emissions is not the same as uh, air quality and pollutants, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. carbon dioxide is it's, it's, uh, colourless, you can't see it. It's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. part of economic activity as yeah. you burn fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Even in international dialogues, a lot of the blame always tends to go to developing countries, yes, right? Yes, like, exactly. But they're, they're going through their industrialization. But this is good because it kind of shows that developed and richer countries are... They need to play their part. They right? need to play their part. And, According to one study, Singapore is ranked top for carbon emissions per capita out of 16 cities selected by a group of researchers. These researchers chose to focus on cities because cities account for about 70% of global carbon emissions arising from energy consumption. Singapore is top because we're economically productive and a wealthy nation. All these robust industries generating income for our country also gobble up energy. On top of that, we import and consume many products. So I just found out that we're part of that 70%. We're, we're part of the problem. But there is some good news. Hear me out. If we can come up with innovations and solutions to make life in our city more sustainable, other cities can follow suit. And then we can really make a difference. But there's some bad news. It could mean scrutinizing a long time stalwart of our economy. Here's the irony. All those years building Singapore into a prosperous and productive city nation, providing good lives to our citizens, comes with a carbon cost. So where do our carbon emissions come from here in Singapore? About 60% comes from industry. And a huge chunk of that, three quarters, comes from our oil refining and petrochemical industry. Currently, the centerpiece is Jurong Island. Here, barrels of oil are refined into products like jet fuel, or turned into chemicals that will eventually become plastics. These are energy-intensive processes, releasing lots of carbon emissions. The island is worth over 50 billion Singapore dollars in investments and employs 26,000 people directly. 
you have to go back pretty far into our history to find the time when the fossil fuel industry first made its mark here in Singapore. All the way back to 1891, in fact. That was when Shell first acquired land on Pulau Buko to store oil. And when our Economic Development Board handed out the very first pioneer certificate to recognize Singapore's earliest foreign investors. It went to Shell for their decision to build an oil refinery on Pulau Bukum in 1961, when the country was still searching for its footing. But in recent years, fossil fuel companies have come under a lot of fire. Researchers at the Climate Accountability Institute found that one third of all emissions released, not just in one year, but from 1965, one third of total emissions since then, can be attributed to just a handful of companies, 20 of them to be exact. All of them fossil fuel companies. I want to find out how the fossil fuel companies here in Singapore are dealing with that backlash. Earlier, I wrote to them. Two weeks later, these are their replies. So it seems that these companies have a game plan to reduce their carbon footprint. They talk about improving their supply chains. They commit their support for the upcoming market for electric vehicles. Some of their numbers and their claims are really quite outstanding. There's one company that says that their ongoing efforts are equivalent to planting four million trees. They're a big part of our economy, and it sounds like they're doing quite a lot about their carbon footprint. But are their efforts enough, and is it really possible to have the best of both worlds? Michael used to be a consultant for a major energy company in the United States. But the more he delved into the world's energy problem, the more he pivoted into research on sustainable development. OK, make yourself comfortable. I've got a few difficult questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. We wrote into a number of energy and petrochemical companies, and they're promising to do all kinds of things, you know, uh, reducing their carbon footprint, uh, do what they can to help deal with this issue of climate change. Is that going to be enough? You know, thank God they're doing it. But most of these efforts at dealing with the climate problem have to do with efficiencies in production, a streamlining of processes. They are initiatives and efforts that you ought to be doing anyway, just if you're a good manager. What we need is more than business as usual. We need actions and responses that are commensurate with the climate emergency we find ourselves in now. So having them here will continue to be a bit of a liability for us as we address climate change. It's going to be a heavy, a heavy bag for Singapore to carry. Then Singapore accounts for about 30% of overall greenhouse gas emissions in the country. And understandably, many people who are worried about climate change would think that we somehow need to evict those folks. But to my way of thinking, that just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it's a dead end. How so? Well, scientifically, you know, if you sort of do the math, you figure out if that industry leaves Singapore, where is it going to go? It's just going to go to another country. Mm -hmm. and it's going to continue to admit the same amount or perhaps even more carbon if that country has more lax regulatory structures. They'll keep doing what they're doing regardless of where they are. Exactly. And then economically, it's going to be a big hit on Singapore if that industry were suddenly, boom, to just disappear tomorrow. I mean, on paper, that industry accounts for about 3% of all economic activity in Singapore, but it's surely larger when you think about all the interconnections with the, uh, the economy. And there would be significant economic burden on Singaporeans and on the government. For what benefit? No scientific, genuine environmental impact on the environment. So what should we be doing? There's a yearning for Singapore to do more. Not because it hasn't already done a lot, but because it is positioned as a global leader. It can set examples, it can inspire, it can motivate in ways that it must if we're to turn the corner on this emergency. There's an opportunity here for Singapore to be smarter, to be faster, to be bolder. Or we can be smarter in our use of electricity. Singapore is already pretty smart, but it's not actually the leading edge of smartness. If we look to places like California, for example, that has made a cottage industry out of squeezing as much human prosperity out of as little electricity as possible, we need to be even faster in our deployment of solar electric. There's a lot of roof space in Singapore that's angled towards the sun perfectly. So smarter and faster, smarter on electricity consumption, yeah. faster on photovoltaics, 
What was the third point? Government is talking about regional grids. Malaysia comes immediately to mind, perhaps Indonesia. These are places with more space for solar farms, for solar arrays. And it's going to take time to work that out. All these suggestions that Michael made, these aren't solutions that you can just whip up on the fly. It's going to take extensive research and trials, which we've already started. But there's one thing we both understand and agree upon. Simple, straightforward solutions like just getting rid of the entire petrochemical industry, it's just not going to work for a complex problem like climate change. That's why, whether you're an activist or a policymaker, you very quickly come to think of climate change as a wicked problem. In the next few episodes, I have to take a deep dive into some familiar issues. Man, yeah, that's disgusting. Holy cow, look at that. Why is there plastic in the can? We can't just follow blindly what other nations are doing. What's the maximum amount of solar Singapore can have? We will always uh, be limited in space, unfortunately. I have to break down all the little things that will make up the unique answers we need for a unique nation. So now I'm confused. We should stop eating chili crab. So it's a messy issue. Yeah, I definitely. <laughs> OK. <laughs> there is no one size fits all. And we need to find out what works for us. This is climate change, a wicked problem.